All right, hello Chem 212 students and welcome to our first lecture for chapter 8 which is about alkenes and addition reactions. So addition reactions are essentially the opposite of elimination reactions. Uh, we learned about elimination reactions in chapter 7. Now in chapter 8 we're going to learn about an addition reaction. We're also going to learn about how to name alkenes. Uh, and alkenes are those molecules that contain carbon-carbon double bonds. Alright, so let's start. Um, so addition is the opposite of elimination. Uh, so when we had elimination, we'd remove some leaving group and a hydrogen, and we'd end up with a double bond. Uh, and in addition, uh, it is the opposite. We start with a double bond, and we add uh, two components here, one to each of the carbons that is on the double bond. Uh, so the, the pi bond here is now two separate sigma bonds, one to this portion x and one to this portion y. Uh, these, these addition reactions will come in, uh, a variety, in many different varieties. Uh, we can have what's called hydrohalogenation. This is when you react uh, uh, an alkene with a hydrohalide, uh, like HCl, HBr, HI. We have the addition of water, which is called hydration. And in this, a hydrogen atom will be added to one of the carbons in the double bond, and an OH group, or hydroxyl group as it's called, will be added to the other. We can have hydrogenation, uh, which is the addition of two hydrogen atoms, uh, which there's a few ways you can do that. One is uh, just reacting with H2, and, and there are others that we'll talk about. Uh, there's also halogenation here. Uh, halogenation is the addition of two halogen atoms from, for example, Cl2 or Br2. Uh, we can have the halohydrin formation, uh, which is what will happen if you add an OH group to one carbon and, an, and a halogen group to the other. And then there's dihydroxylation, which is adding a hydroxyl group, which is the OH, uh, to each of the carbons on, on the alkene there. Uh, so, Remember that when we were talking about nucleophiles and electrophiles, uh, remember a nucleophile is something that has a pair of electrons that it can give to create a bond. And uh, a good, uh, uh, or, or sorry, a, a nucleophile has a pair of electrons that can give to create a bond. And so uh, in the past, we've seen these been mo they have been mostly uh, negative ions. Um, but there are others. Uh, pi bonds can behave as a nucleophile. This is because the electrons that are in the pi bond are much uh, much more weakly held than those that are in the sigma bonds. The sigma bonds is, uh, are due to the direct overlap of the orbitals, so the electrons are right between the atoms and hard to get out. But the pi bonds, remember, are from the sideways overlap of p orbitals, so the, the electrons are way out here, and it's pretty easy for them to go and get donated to something that is positive. So here we have a bond between a hydrogen and a very electronegative atom, and so we can have a uh, a proton transfer here where we have the electrons from the pi bond or those are the ones to make the bond to the hydrogen and then the electrons are both left behind in the bond to the hydrogen and the other atom so we have two arrows there and in the end this gives us a bond to one of the carbons but the other carbon now will have three bonds in no lone pairs so it will have a positive formal charge um, so this is, this is a, 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 a pi bond behaving as a base. It can also behave as a nucleophile. As I said, these electrons will be attracted to something positive. Uh, it is, it's a base here because it's grabbing a proton. Here it's a, it's a nucleophile because it's giving those electrons in order to make a, uh, a bond to some positive thing, some electrophile. And like in the same fashion, we get a bond to one of the carbon atoms, but the other carbon atom now, because there's no double bond, has three bonds and no lone pairs. And so it will have a positive formal charge. Uh, alkenes are present all over the place in, uh, in nature and in uh, synthetic chemistry. Uh, so we have allicin here, which contains two double bonds. This is the odor of garlic here. Uh, geraniol, which is from roses, has double bonds as well. Uh, we have uh, this Farnesine, which is a, uh, a waxy coating on apple skins. It's got lots of double bonds. Cholesterol here has this double bond here between two carbons. Uh, limonene, which is a lemon type, orange type smell, um, uh, orange type smell here. Uh, we have this double bonds here. And uh, pinene, 
uh, from pine resin, also double bonds. There's, there's just carbon-carbon double bonds, alkene groups everywhere in nature. Uh, if we want to get, uh, if we want to use double bonds and, and, and do addition reactions, we need to get uh, some molecules, we need to start some, with some molecules that contain a carbon-carbon double bond, and these are regularly sourced from petroleum, uh, the same place, you know, we get our gasoline and coal and all these other things, uh, uh, methane. And so uh, two common uh, components of petroleum that we dig out of the ground are ethylene or ethene, uh, which is just C2H4, and uh, uh, <clears throat> propene, or also called propylene. Ethylene and propylene are common names that are very commonly used. And these, are, these go on to make all kinds of different chemical feedstocks, uh, including many molecules that you're familiar with, such as isopropyl alcohol, uh, acetone, which you see in the lab there. Um, we have vinyl chloride, which goes on to make polyvinyl chloride, or PVC, which is what most of our pipes in our house are made out of. Uh, ethanol, acetic acid, all kinds of things can be made from this petroleum. So if you ever wondered where all these chemicals come from, these common ones that we have in the lab, well, a lot of them come from doing addition reactions on petroleum uh, products here. In terms of naming, um, the naming generally follows the rules of alkanes. However, we have some additional rules that we need to follow because we have double double carbon-carbon uh, double bonds. Um, so in the case of identifying the parent chain here, um, when it came to alkanes, we were just looking for the longest chain of carbon atoms. But when we have a carbon-carbon double bond, we need the longest chain of carbon atoms that contains a double bond. It must contain the double bond. So we say the double bond has priority here, and it must be in the parent chain. Uh, we identify the substituents. We assign locants. Uh, and again, here's where the rules differ a little bit. Uh, when we have alkanes only, we assign the, the locant uh, to start at the end that's closest to the first branch. But when we have a carbon-carbon double bond, we start at the end that will give the carbon-carbon double bond the carbons with the lowest locant number. So we start on the side closest to the double bond. Um, we list out the substituents, make sure we know what they all are. Uh, they're going to be written in the name in alphabetical order, just like before. And the carbon-carbon double bond is uh, placed, at the, the, the locant is placed just before the parent name or just before the ene suffix. So we got two choices of where to put the locant that indicates where the carbon-carbon double bond is. Uh, generally, I'll put it before the parent name, but in some cases, if you have, uh, when we get to alcohols, it will sometimes be necessary to put the locant right before the ene uh, for reasons that we'll talk about then. So uh, in terms of the parent chain here, uh, it must include the carbon-carbon double bond, as we said. So here we have uh, pentane. It ends with ane because it has five carbon atoms in it, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, here, this one's called pentene as the, as the parent chain name, one, two, three, four, five. And if we're going to make a full name, uh, if we wanted to give this a full name, we'd, we'd assign it locants. We're about to talk about locants in a second, but Remember, when we assign the locants, we would start from the side closest to the double bond. So this would, in fact, be one pentene, as opposed to having the double bond somewhere in the middle. Uh, but the parent chain name is pentene, ene because there's a double bond. And again, the, the parent chain must include the double bond here. So uh, whereas in this, in this example here, which is an alkane, uh, we choose the longest chain of carbon atoms, which contains eight here. And so we have a prefix of oct, and we end with ane because there's only carbon-carbon double uh, single bonds, but when there's a carbon-carbon double bond, we've got to include the double bond in the chain. So although we have a chain here of eight carbon atoms, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that is not the longest chain that contains the double bond. Uh, we have to contain the double bond. So there's two choices, one, two, three, four, five, six, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So going this way is longer. So that's why the one outlined in red here is the correct parent chain. And we would call that parent chain hept because there's seven carbons in it and ene because there is a carbon-carbon double bond. So um, <clears throat> in terms of the uh, substituents here now, now let's take a look at the substituents and not just the parent name. 
uh, we if we want to number the substituents we're gonna have to have locants for our numbers so the locants here again we always start with the locants on the side closest to the double bond uh, so we go one two three four five six seven not one two three four five six seven from the left to right in this case not right to left and you may be thinking but dr l before when we did alkenes we did the numbering based on which is closest to the first group and so you know here the alkene is on number two and here the methyl group is on number two and then on number three we've got two methyl groups so if there were no double bond you're right we would be numbering from right to left but since there is a double bond the double bond has priority so we're going to number from left to right on the side closest to the double bond that's most important even if there's a, a a substituent with a lower number that what matters is that the double bond gets the lowest number <clears throat> okay so now let's finally finish the name for this so we've got the parent name here the parent name is going to be uh, it's going to end with ene because we have a double bond right here so it ends with ene and this this uh, longest chain here has one two three four five six seven carbons so it's going to be heptene. Okay. And now we have to put a number for the locant uh, for the double bond right before either the hept or the ene. We can put it in either spot. So we're going to put it, I like to put it before the hept unless for some other reason I'm forced to put it in front of the ene. And there will be situations like that when we get to alcohol. Uh, now we identify our our branches. We've got one methyl group here, one methyl group here, and one methyl group here. Okay, and so we've got three methyl groups, so we're going to say trimethyl, trimethyl. And we have to indicate where those methyl groups are. There's two on carbon number five and one on carbon number six. So we're going to say five, five, six and then we put a dash remember the letters never touch the numbers directly there's always a dash in between and we're almost done here <clears throat> there's one more thing to think about we can't forget about stereoisomerism when we've got uh, chiral carbons or when we got double bonds uh, when we have double bonds we have to use the e and z method that we discussed in the previous chapter. So remember, Z means on the same side, and E means on the opposite side. Uh, so this one's pretty clear to see here because we've got um, the hydrogen groups. So we could actually, uh, if we look here, we've got hydrogen here. It's not drawn in, but there's a hydrogen here, and there's a hydrogen here. So we could say trans here. We could say trans. Trans would be OK. Um, but uh, more generally, it, trans doesn't always work, right? Because imagine one of these wasn't a hydrogen. Then you'd have four different groups. So you can't say that there's the same group on opposite sides. So that's when you have to use E or Z. And Z would mean on the same side. E means opposite side. Since the hydrogens here, these are the lower priority groups. So if we're prioritizing them, um, Carbon beats hydrogen, so this would be priority one, priority two. And then here again, carbon beats hydrogen, so this would be priority one, priority two. Um, remember, we, we count these just like in R and S based on the molar mass. The molar mass of carbon is greater than that of hydrogen. So since the lower priority groups and the higher priority groups are on opposite sides, we won't say on the same side, we'll say on opposite sides, and that it will be E. So we say E. And we would have to indicate a number if there was more than one double bond, but there's only one double bond here. And that's how you name alkenes. So not too much different. Just remember, the big difference here is the double bond now has the priority. It's always in the parent chain. It's all, you always number from the side closest to it. And don't forget to put a locant to say where the double bond is. And those are the main differences. So one thing to note is that addition and elimination are generally in equilibrium. And so we talked a lot about elimination reactions in the last chapter. 
and how they'll produce a particular product. But uh, in this chapter, we're going to basically be doing the opposite and taking these, these uh, alkene and some type of reagent here and reacting them to do the opposite of elimination. So uh, in this case, if you're wondering, uh, you know, which side, which side will be preferred here? Will we get elimination? Or will, you know, this reaction hardly go in the elimination direction? Will it go much more strongly in the addition direction? And this is going to be driven mostly by entropy. Because remember, entropy increases when you end up with more molecules, more pieces, and decreases when you end up with fewer. So in addition reactions, these are decreasing in entropy. And so what we need is for this entropy term here, to be small because if it's large then they will have a negative entropy which will give us a positive overall entropy term and that will make delta G more positive so uh, we need to make sure that the temperature is low for these addition reactions to occur uh, because that will make the entropy term small remember the entropy here so going left to right the entropy is negative right so this whole term here uh, with the negative is positive and the bigger this term gets the more positive delta G will get so we want this term small compared to the delta H and so uh, higher uh, higher temperature is going to mean a bigger entropy term which will mean that this will be less spontaneous uh, so this is going to be spontaneous more spontaneous at the lower temperatures In terms of delta H, uh, addition reactions are generally favored by enthalpy. Uh, the reason why is because pi bonds are generally quite weak. So remember, we're going to have a exothermic reaction when we break weak bonds and we make stronger bonds, right? And we'll have an endothermic reaction uh, when when we break weak uh, break strong bonds and we create weaker bonds. So in any case, that this pi bond is going to be Quite, uh, quite small in energy compared to the sigma bonds that are produced. So we're breaking a weak pi bond and a, a relatively strong single sigma bond, but we're getting two sigma bonds out of the deal. So generally, uh, these addition reactions are going to be quite exothermic. And so again, uh, that's going to be the negative term here, delta H. So we can make the whole reaction spontaneous if we make sure that the entropy term stays small and does not overwhelm the enthalpy term and so that that will happen when the temperature is low um, so addition so to summarize addition reactions are not favored by entropy uh, generally um, you can see we're going from two two uh, molecules down to one they are favored by enthalpy so a small entropy term and a large and a large enthalpy term is what we're looking for so the reaction will proceed towards addition uh, at low temperatures, and it will be towards elimination at higher temperatures. Again, delta H or delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. So this term here with the negative, because delta S is, is negative, it's, it's, un, it's decreasing in entropy. This whole second term is positive and the enthalpy is generally negative. So we make this reaction spontaneous in the forward direction here by making the second term small so that the first term is larger. We make the opposite reaction go when we have high temperatures. So temperature can be used to control uh, addition versus elimination. Um, so let's talk about the types of, of addition reactions now. Uh, the first that we'll talk about is hydrohalogenation. So this is the reaction you get when you add HX to an alkene. So this includes HCl, HBr, HI. Remember, let's remember fluorine's been you know excluded from a lot of these, uh, right? Why? It's because the HF bond is pretty strong, so that makes the whole reaction pretty unfavorable. It's hard to break that bond um, and make and do the addition. And so uh, when this happens, we're going to add a hydrogen to one uh, to one of the carbons, and this is 
this is symmetrical, so it doesn't matter which one we choose. Uh, and, the bro and, and the bromine or whatever, I'll call it the X to the other. In this case, it's bromine. Uh, so the hydrogen's here, but it's just not drawn. And uh, notice that this is done at a low temperature to promote the uh, addition versus the elimination. If the alkene isn't symmetrical, then we have regiochemistry considerations. Where will the hydrogen go? Where will the halogen atom go? Okay. And so we're going to have to think about what might influence that. So when we look at this, um, this, this particular structure here, there's one hydrogen atom on this carbon on the double bond. There's no hydrogen atoms attached to this carbon. So what we observe uh, is that the hydrogen ends up attached to the hydrogen that already has more hydrogens. Uh, some people say this, they call this the rich get richer. Um, the carbon that is, what's richer? Uh, the carbon that is rich with hydrogen atoms gets more hydrogen atoms. Uh, honestly, the way I think of it is more in the second way here. You can think of it in either way. Uh, this carbon is less substituted. It only has one carbon attached. This carbon is more substituted. It has two carbons attached. So the halogen atom goes to the carbon that is more substituted. Uh, so that's the two ways of looking at it. The hydrogen goes to the carbon that already has more hydrogens, or the halogen atoms goes to the more substituted carbon. This is referred to as a Markovnikov addition. I don't care if you remember that name or not. Uh, just remember the result, right? Uh, or, or at least I'll explain to you why it happens to it. Again, we don't want to be memorizing too much. We want to be understanding why these things happen, right? Um, so we can direct uh, we can direct the hydrohalogenation to occur in a anti-Markovnikov fashion, where the halogen atom gets added to the less substituted carbon instead. To do this, we introduce a uh, peroxide. So a peroxide is a kind of molecule that has an oxygen-oxygen bond in it. Uh, and then the R here means, you know, any carbon atom. So these carbon atoms are attached to other carbon atoms and, and so forth. And it could even be hydrogen atoms, uh, carbon or hydrogen or hydrogen. But the key feature is that you have uh, two oxygens bonded to one another. So this is, this is uh, abbreviated as ROR, R-O-O-R. Uh, the R is meaning just any other things attached to these oxygens. Um, now, why does this happen? Uh, it has to do with a um, radical reaction mechanism, and we're going to be learning about that radical re reaction mechanism uh, in, in a later chapter. Uh, but essentially what happens is that along the way, you end up with a radical intermediate, and the radical intermediates are more stable uh, when the radical is on the more substituted uh, carbon. And so we end up at, with the addition of the bromine on a less substituted one, and then the hydro we end up with the hydrogen um, making the bond here at the, uh, at the more substituted carbon instead of the less substituted one. Uh, we're going to go into more detail on this mechanism when we talk about radicals. We haven't talked about radicals yet. But you don't have to memorize this. Uh, as we move forward, you're going to notice we're going to encounter a lot of new reactions. And I will give you a list that includes all of these reactions uh, uh, that you may use on the exam. And I'll be doing this uh, right after we're done with this chapter and when we go into the next chapter. Uh, so the important thing to know here is that you can control the regioselectivity uh, here with the addition to a double bond in the hydrohalogenation. Uh, if, you, if you just use the hydro, uh, hydrohalogen here, uh, the, the H, uh, the hydrohalide rather, the HBr for example, uh, the halogen atom will attach to the more substituted carbon. However, if you use uh, the hydrohalide along with a peroxide, Instead, the halogen atom will attach to the less substituted carbon. So let's draw the products for these. 
Uh, you may wish to pause the video here and try this yourself. I would highly recommend that. And then see if you got it right or wrong. It's okay to get it wrong, right? As long as you tried. You learn when you try, even when you get it wrong, because then you get it right the next time. Okay, so pause the video. All right, all right, let's see if your answers were correct. So here we have HBR. So the addition is going to in, uh, happen on the more substituted carbon. So here the more substituted carbon is going to be uh, this one right here. So we no longer have the double bond, but here we're going to have a methyl group and we're going to have a bromine. And this is not a chiral carbon, so we don't have to worry about chirality in this case. We'll talk about the stereochemistry in a moment. Um, in terms of this one, now this one has the peroxide in it. So the halogen atom is going to attach to the carbon that is less substituted. So uh, we have two possibilities, this one here and this one here. Here we had this one and this one. So we chose the more substituted in this one. Here we're going to choose the less substituted. This one has two carbons attached. This one has only one. And so it's going to be Br. And uh, those are the results there. Now, how does this happen? Um, why? Why does the halogen atom go on the more substituted carbon, right? We don't want to just memorize this. You shouldn't be straight memorizing hardly anything. I'll let you know when, when we, there's a lot, there's some re reactions we don't know the mechanism. So you have to straight memorize because no one knows why exactly. But here we have a really good idea of why. So in this case, the, um, the pi bond again is a nucleophile. Those electrons can be given pretty freely. The hydrogen here is the electrophile because the, this is a polar bond. The bromine is pulling the electrons towards its way. So it's partially negative where the bromine is and partially positive where the hydrogen is. So these electrons are attracted to that hydrogen. And we start here in this addition with a proton transfer in this hydrohalogenation. So we start the arrow where the pi bond is, we finish it where the hydrogen is, and that hydrogen is it, it leaves as a proton, so it leaves both electrons behind, and we get bromide. And now, though, we have the hydrogen here. Uh, the hydrogen has become attached to the less substituted carbon, and the reason why is because that results in a carbocation that is on the more substituted carbon. Imagine that it went to the less substituted carbon. So this is not how it goes. Um, we would have the hydrogen being attached right here. And then this would be the carbocation. Well, that is not favorable, right? And so we're not going to get that result instead. We're going to get this one because remember uh, the the more substituted carbocations are more stable. So in the end, then uh, we have a nucleophilic attack of the bromide onto that uh, carbocation, and we get the addition of the bromine. So that is why, if we do not have a peroxide, the uh, the halide will attach to the more substituted carbon. It is due to the more stable tertiary carbocation intermediate. So in terms of energy diagram, notice this was a two-step process. So the energy diagram that describes it has two bumps in it. It does have an intermediate here. So we have the alkene and the HBr. It goes through a carbocation intermediate. The more stable carbocation intermediate is the tertiary carbocation. And then the, that's the proton transfer. Then the second step is a nucleophilic attack. Uh, then the bromide comes in here and attacks on the positive uh, charge here, and then we, uh, we get the uh, addition product. So notice that the activation energy here uh, is the first step here is the rate determining step. So the activation energy for the first step is, is higher than the one for the second step. So the first step here is the rate determining step. And so it depends on the concentration of the alkene and the uh, <clears throat> hydrohalide. Now remember, there's another product. There's an anti-Markovnikov too, right? Uh, so notice that the anti-Markovnikov reaction pathway, again, using this mechanism, would be highly unfavorable compared to the Markovnikov pathway. This is because the anti-Markovnikov pathway would involve a secondary carbocation in this case, 
which is much less stable than this tertiary carbocation. So that is why we get the Markovnikov product and not, not, so we get, we don't get this, we do get this. Uh, here's an energy diagram that shows that with the transition state here. Uh, so this is for the second step. Uh, the, so the first step is, all, uh, um, let's see here. Uh, oh, no, sorry, this is for the first step. Uh, so the first step is about to happen. And notice why the, uh, the Markovnikov result is more favorable. It's because in the transition state here, uh, the hydrogen is attaching to the less substituted carbon. And uh, so we almost have a bond here. The result is that we have a partial positive charge here on the uh, tertiary carbon here. And that is more stable than having the positive partial charge on the secondary carbon. And ultimately it leads to the more stable intermediate where the uh, tertiary, the positive formal charge is on the tertiary, uh, tertiary carbon rather than the secondary. And you can see here in the transition state, the double bond is starting to leave, the bond between hydrogen and carbon is starting to form, and the bond between hydrogen and the halogen is starting to break, and that halogen is starting to get a negative charge as it grabs those electrons. Uh, so sometimes we may end up with a chiral carbon after the addition of, of the hy uh, hydrohalide. So um, the question is, what would be the stereochemistry? Well, we know this reaction occurs through a, a carbocation intermediate, right? So in this case here, uh, we could show that we're going to have a proton transfer. And then... Uh, the more favorable product is the one with the more substituted uh, carbocation. So the hydrogen here attaches to this, this carbon on the end. So here's that hydrogen along with another two that are also there. And thus, uh, we have a secondary carbocation. And that is much more stable than a primary one. So that's why the hydrogen attaches right on the end here rather than in the middle. Uh, well, that's going to be followed up by a chloride nucleophilic attack, right? Uh, so that chloride nucleophilic attack is going to happen right here. And notice we have a flat tertiary carbocation intermediate. So just like when we had an SN1 reaction, uh, this nucleophilic attack can occur from either side equally. Uh, because we're going through this carbocation intermediate. So we're going to have a racemic mixture. We're going to have a racemic mixture of the enantiomers here, just like we would in an SN1 reaction. So there's the regiochemistry, Markovnikov versus anti-Markovnikov, and the stereochemistry is racemic mixture, equal amounts of both enantiomers. Racine Mick, not Mim. And here's a picture showing that again. Uh, we have a tertiary, we have a carbocation here, which is flat trigonal planar. Therefore, the um, the nucleophile, or the nucleophilic attack can, can happen from the bottom. It can just as equally happen from the top, and so you'll have a mixture of orbitals. Now, one thing to watch out for is because this occurs through a carbocation intermediate, we have to be careful of the potential for a uh, carbocation rearrangement along the way. So in this case here, we have the, uh, the proton transfer here, where it, the proton is grabbed, and the proton now goes to the less substituted carbon, so it the, the proton is now right here, and that leaves this carbon with three bonds and no lone pairs. So it is a carbocation, but it's a secondary carbocation. If we have a hydride shift here, there's a hydrogen. If we have this hydride shift, then uh, we will have this carbon right here having three bonds and no lone pairs. So now it will be a tertiary carbocation, which is much more favorable. And then the result is we can have the nucleophilic attack on that carbon and uh, we would get this result. And notice this carbon is not chiral because there's two methyl groups which are the same, so we don't have to worry about stereochemistry there. 
So just like in SN1 and E1 reactions where, uh, where we had to watch out for the carbocation rearrangement uh, because we went through a carbocation intermediate, here we have to watch out for a carbocation rearrangement in the addition reaction. Um, so when carbocation rearrangements can occur, they do occur. But notice they're not complete, right? Um, we will have some of the product that uh, the nucleophile attacked before the carbocation rearrangement occurred. And some of the product, uh, the majority, will be after the rearrangement, but not by a significant amount in this case. It's really going to depend on the local environment, right? If there's, if there's resonance, that will, that will definitely stabilize a carbocation even more and would um, lead to maybe even more re of the rearrangement product. You're not expected to know exactly the split here. This is determined by experiment. Um, you, there's no, not something you should try to memorize, uh, but you should understand the idea that a carbocation rearrangement could occur. Um, okay, so that is a uh, <clears throat> hydrohalogenation. Uh, now let's talk about a acid catalyzed hydration. Uh, so this is actually the opposite of the acid catalyzed elimination, E1 elimination, that we discussed in the previous chapter uh, near the end. And so um, here, acid catalyzed hydration, um, this is going to follow the Markovnikov regioselectivity. Uh, so what's going to happen here uh, is we'll have a this uh, this double bond will grab a proton just like we've seen before with that uh, um, hydrohalogenation. That proton will attach itself to the less substituted carbon, and we will get a vast majority here of uh, water attacking uh, the OH being attached over here. So if we if we add acid and water, um, which is often just indicated as H2SO4. Um, it's assumed that this is this is going to be aqueous if we're doing this. Uh, so this is com commonly the catalyst. And remember, we talked about H2SO4 doing elimination in the last chapter. And so we were talking about the reverse of this reaction. And so the, um, here, we also talked about the reverse, which was the elimination, elimination uh, by E1. Okay, uh, that elimination, remember that the that we can use temperature to control this, right? And so, uh, if we want, if we want the elimination to happen, then uh, we would want to do this uh, at the high temperature, high temp. And so, this direction would be low temp. Remember, uh, that's how we can control uh, the the equilibrium between these. So. If we have it at low temp, we add water and sulfuric acid. We can add a hydroxyl group to the uh, to the more substituted carbon with you know a significant majority there. Uh, in terms of of uh, the, the rate here, um, so the OH is added to the more substituted carbon in the alkane. Uh, the more substituted carbon is a faster uh, reaction here, right? Uh, so we can see here if in, in the case of ethene, when we add it, um, this is going to go very slow compared to, because remember, it has to go through a carbocation intermediate. So the carbocation intermediate here would look like this. It would be primary, uh, primary carbocation, whereas here, the carbocation would be uh, secondary. And on this one, the carbocation intermediate would be pri uh, tertiary. And so you can see that if there's a possibility for a Ter tertiary carbocation uh, during the addition, that's going to really, really speed up the reaction. Uh, this is going to go really, really slow if, the, if uh, we're trying to add alcohol and the only possibility is a primary carbon. We'll go much faster if we can get a tertiary carbocation intermediate because the activation energy to reach that, uh, that transition state and subsequent intermediate will be much lower. So here's the mechanism. Uh, so we don't. We generally don't draw the H2SO4. We draw hydronium because H2SO4 is a stronger acid than water, so it just gives its proton to water, right? And so the proton is effectively attached to the water. So we draw it with the water. We have a proton transfer, like we start started all the eliminations so far, and uh, and so the pi. We start the arrow with the pi bond. It goes to the hydrogen that makes a bond here, and then we leave those electrons behind. 
and the hydrogen ends up attaching right here because right here because that's going to leave us with this carbon on the left with three bonds and no long pairs so it is uh, the carbocation intermediate then we have a nucleophilic attack by water now importantly uh, you learned in the last chapter that when we have a neutral nucleophile attacking we will end up like in this case we're going to end up with um, this oxygen now having one lone pair because one lone pair was given to make the bond and it has two hydrogens so this oxygen is making three bonds and has no lone pairs so it is a positive formal charge so this is not a particularly stable structure yet uh, we need to recover the hydrogen and that this is why this is called an acid catalyzed reaction uh, when it's catalyzed it means that the acid is not a reactant in the reaction it is something that helps the reaction go but is recovered by the end of the reaction so by the end of the reaction we need to get hydronium back and the way we're going to do that is that the another water molecule will come along that isn't protonated and then it will deprotonate that and then we'll end up with the alcohol and that's shown on the next slide so we have the the protonated uh, you know oxygen here water comes by deprotonates it and we get uh, the the OH group now attached and remember now this this water has now had now it has oxygen with only one lone pair and three hydrogens attached so this is hydronium so we have recovered the hydronium um, and so that that means that the alcohol was not a reactant it was a it was a, a catalyst in this reaction it made the reaction go faster however it was not consumed in the reaction it was recovered by the end so um, we've talked about how we can control a reaction like this using the temperature but that's not the only way we can control this reaction uh, recall from Le Chatelier's principle that if we add more reactant uh, the equilibrium has to shift to get rid of that reactant if we add more product the equilibrium has to shift to get rid of that extra product we added so um, notice that the H2SO4 here um, we're, we're making this alcohol from the alkene um, we're going to use excess water here we want to have a lot of water a lot of water because water is a reactant here we're adding water so we don't want the the sulfuric acid to be too concentrated you can you can figure this out looking at the mechanism if there's too much sulfuric acid there's going to be very little water and this last step won't be able to happen water is a reactant in this reaction <clears throat> okay or this step here will not be able to happen there will not be enough water all of them will be protonated so if we want the uh, addition to happen we not, we not only want the temperature to be low, we also want the solution to be dilute sulfuric acid, enough to catalyze the reaction, but we don't need any more. Uh, what we need is a lot of water, because we're adding water, and water's a reactant. If we want to go the other way, you'll notice that in chapter seven it said, if we want to do an elimination of water, we want concentrated sulfuric acid. And now we can understand the reason why. It's because if we, if we have less water, here we're removing water that shifts the equilibrium to the left to replace the water if we have more water if we have more water well the reaction now will shift to the right to get rid of that additional water so we have more water when the sulfuric acid is dilute uh, we have less water when it's concentrated because those are instead all protonated waters or hydroniums so we can control uh, this reaction by both the concentration of the sulfuric acid and by the temperature. In terms of stereochemistry, this goes through a very, very similar mechanism, except for that we have a neutral uh, nucleophile, uh, unlike the hydrohalogenation. But the mechanism is, is basically the same as the hydrohalogenation. The only thing that's different is there's one last step 
to deprotonate at the end. So you'll notice this part here, this looked just like the hydrohalogenation, right? We protonate, we get a carbocation intermediate, then the nucleophile attacks. The difference is that this nucleophile is, is not, a, not negative, it's neutral. So at the end, it has to be deprotonated to produce a neutral product. Um, but otherwise, the mechanism is exactly the same. So we're going to get a racemic mixture of products in the case where there's a chiral carbon. So in this case, we're adding water here. Uh, the, the H goes to the more substitute or to the less substitute carbon, and the OH goes to the more substitute carbon. However, this carbon ends up being, and so then this double bond goes away. Uh, this carbon ends up being chiral because it's attached to four different groups. And so we need to draw both stereoisomers with the OH on the wedge here and the OH on the dash, both. Uh, so al always watch out for that chiral center being formed. If you have a chiral center being formed, make sure to indicate that you're getting a racemic mixture of products here. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now there are ways to control uh, this um, water addition so that we can uh, we we can avoid certain things that happen for example rearrangements often occur and that's a big problem if we want a particular type of product so we use a so-called oxymercuration demercuration reaction as opposed to the acid catalyzed hydration to control the regioselectivity of the product so that it won't have a rearrangement and put the OH in a different place here. Uh, so the oxymercuration uh, involves the attachment of a, uh, of a reagent that contains mercury. That mercury makes a bond to this carbon. And then we remove that, port, and then we have the addition occur uh, at the same time here. And then we have the removal of the mercury portion. And so this involves a very complex mechanism that this one, unfortunately, you're going to have to memorize a little bit. Uh, I will ask you to know this mechanism. Uh, so here's the way it works. Um, you should know this. So we start with mercuric acetate. So these ACs here, AC refers to the uh, um, ac like acetic acid, but without the H here. Uh, so it has carbon double bond to oxygen, also bond to carbon with the methyl group. So that's what the AC means. The AC means all of this, OAC. Uh, so we have first the loss of this as a leaving group, and that leaves this mercury with a positive formal charge to it. Uh, so the, you can remember that because the acetate ion is going to be negative, and you can't just be making charges from nowhere, so that means there must be a positive charge left. Or you can just remember because both the electrons left here, the mercury lost one of its electrons. So that's going to be the start. And um, at that point, uh, we're, going to have, um, <clears throat> we're, we're going to have the reaction instead of having the, the pi electrons here uh, grab a proton and do a proton transfer, as we saw before, and make the carbocation intermediate in that way. Instead, the pi electrons are going to be attracted to this positive mercury. And so that will result in a bond to the mercury. And that mercury will, because it's so large and the electrons are so loosely held, mercury is this huge metal atom with a very, very weak grip on its electrons. Uh, the result is that this mercury with its lone pair here can uh, then go and make another bond to this carbon right here. And the result is that uh, the carbon with the positive formal charge, these electrons will be attracted to it. And so because that occurs, uh, we cannot have a carbocation rearrangement, right? If the, when we add the proton, notice that we're going to get the carbocation that's, that's tertiary here. Uh, here, um, now in this case, we would get the carbocation here that's tertiary. However, the mercury is locking up both these carbons. And now it has the positive formal charge. Uh, and so this is referred to as a mercurinium ion. And this type of way of controlling regiochemistry, uh, we're going to see this again. This is going to become a kind of pattern of how we control um, uh, stereochemistry uh, or, or how it, it is controlled during the mechanism. 
And so that's why this, this mechanism, although it's kind of a, a little bit awkward and a little bit different from other mechanisms you'll see, it's important to understand and to memorize to some extent. Uh, finally, the nucleophile will go and attack. It will go and attack uh, where, to the carbon that is bonded to the mercury. Uh, and that will have a, the mercury here has this partial positive charge and so is the carbon. This bond is like kind of partially formed. Right, and so then the nucleophile attacks, and and then that mercury leaves. Uh, finally, we'll use a sodium borohydride to remove uh, the mercury group, and then replace it with a hydrogen. This will occur by a free radical mechanism. Uh, and so that part of the mechanism, though, so I'm not giving you a full mechanism here. This is the part of the mechanism that's really important. You need to know that it goes through this mercurinium ion, and that is the reason why the um, the stereochemistry is controlled here, and there aren't car or the regiochemistry rather, and there aren't carbocation rearrangements. So, to summarize, um, <clears throat> here we have a prime example of a reactant that, under the acid catalyzed uh, addition could undergo carbocation rearrangement because when, uh, I'll draw the first step here, when this gets protonated, uh, the hydrogen is going to attach to this carbon right here. And thus, this carbon here will have three bonds and no lone pairs. It will be positively formal charged. However, um, we have also a hydrogen right here. And so there is the possibility of a carbocation rearrangement occurring here and then at that point the carbocation is in the tertiary position so the hydrogen's here now and the carbocation is in this tertiary position which is far more stable so we're going to end up with a mixture of products uh, where now the water can attack either uh, right here on the secondary carbon so if we have water here water this water can attack either right here or it can attack right here and so you end up with OH groups on either this carbon or on this carbon however if we use this this uh, this uh, oxymercuration demercuration we do it in two steps first we use the mercuric uh, acetate and water like we saw here right in the in the uh, arrangement here we use the mercuric acetate and water and then uh, we treat with sodium borohydride uh, and we will not get any rearrangement so we'll we'll end up with here in this case we'll end up with the mercurinium ion right here so I'll draw this one in red in this case we're going to end up with um, the mercurinium ion as an intermediate and this is HG so the carbocation rearrangement will be unable to occur and then we'll have the attack of the water right here uh, and and we'll end up adding the water at the same position without so this second position and we'll not have the rearrangement to the other one and so that's the value of the oxymercuration demercuration The other possibility is the hydroboration oxidation. Uh, this is another one with a kind of unusual mechanism, but extremely important due to uh, the way that the, the intermediates that we get uh, and are, are interesting and kind of unique, and they explain to you why the reaction occurs the way that it does. This one's going to occur in two steps, too. Uh, it's going to be uh, BH3 in a THF solvent. Uh, first, and then we'll treat with hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide. And again, you don't need to memorize the reagents. Uh, I will give you the list of reactions with reagents, but you do need to know how to use them. And so, what this will do to us, do for us, is is allow for a anti-Markovnikov regioselectivity. So, note that <clears throat> we did acid catalyzed hydration. We got Markovnikov regioselectivity, but there was rearrangements. We did oxymercuration demercuration. We also got Markovnikov regioselectivity, but we eliminated the possibility of um, 
of rearrangements. In this case, this is the way we get anti-Markovnikov addition. So with the Markovnikov addition, the OH would have been added right here. So this would have been Markovnikov. Markovnikov. However, the anti-Markovnikov, so right here, basically. But instead, we're going to have the, uh, the OH attached to the less substituted carbon. And so this, this is going to happen in two major steps. Uh, the first will be the treatment of the, the BH3 with the THF. The reason why this needs to happen, uh, well, we'll talk about the mechanism in a second. Uh, one, notice, one thing to note is that, as we're going to see in the mechanism, uh, the hydroboration oxidation here is going to be stereoselective. Because of the way the mechanism works, when we add the H and the OH, they're going to add on the same side. Um, and we're going to get, in this case, two enantiomers. We will get um, the H and the OH attached on one side on the wedge here. Uh, so here they're attaching here on the wedge to this carbon and this carbon on the wedge. And so this methyl group goes on the dash in that case. Or it will attach on the dash and this methyl group would go to the wedge. What we will not get is we will not get this result. Um, where the OH and the H attach in opposite ways, or it's diastereomer. We will not get that one using the hydroboration oxidation. So we will not get these right here. And when it comes to BH3, so BH3 is, uh, is got three bonds and no lone pairs. So it's sp2 hybridized. Uh, and uh, so it has a trigonal planar geometry. So this is, and this is called boring. So it's like a carbocation in terms of geometry. Uh, now the reason why we need the THF is because when you have BH3, notice it's only making three bonds, which is kind of weird, right? Uh, and so it tends to make a dimer uh, where the, each of these two BH3s are attached to one another and they're sharing the hydrogen atoms and both bonding to them, which, res, which gives, us kind of, gives it kind of a pseudo four bonds on the, on the boron. And so in order to avoid this, we need to add the THF as a solvent to, uh, to react with the BH3 so it doesn't produce this dimer. Uh, so the B2H6 can be stabilized by using ether solvent, uh, the, the THF ether here. And so that will make a bond to the boron, give it its four bonds. In terms of um, formal charges, it has a negative formal charge because boron is in group three of the periodic table. However, if we count its dots, so giving it one dot for each bond, it has four dots. So that's one more dot than three. And that's why it has a negative formal charge. When the oxygen makes this bond, it has three bonds and one lone pair, so it has a positive formal charge. So this BH3-THF complex gets formed here. Uh, as we mentioned, hydroboration uh, follows the anti-Markovnikov regioselectivity. And this, this kind of unusual mechanism is going to show why. So this boron uh, <clears throat> here, uh, it's... It's going to uh, it's going to be part uh, as we saw with the BH three THF. So notice we're not going to draw the, the THF here, right? Uh, this is just showing you how it keeps it from dimerizing. Eventually, when the reaction occurs, it will it will come off. Uh, so in in this case, uh, what we end up having is a bond that goes from the double bond to the boron, and then a hydrogen here makes a bond to the more substituted carbon. And so we end up with this hydrogen here bonding to this carbon and this boron bonding to this carbon. And so we have BH2 on one carbon and H on the other. So this is the key, key part in the mechanism because this is going, and eventually where the BH2 is, that's going to be replaced with the, with the OH group, the hydroxyl group. And so because the BH2 attaches uh, here at the less substituted carbon, um, that's going to result in uh, uh, a, a less substituted uh, replacement here or addition of the OH. And uh, <clears throat> so
so notice why does this happen? Uh, well, it's because you know this is going to be a little bit harder to get in here kinetically. Uh, it's going to be hard for this to get in here. So the boron kind of hangs out on the outside. And this is going to occur three times. Uh, so each of these substrate molecules will be attached. And we'll also have three of these substrates. So if we're fully drawing it out, we have one of these. And then uh, what will happen is we'll have another substrate molecule come by, this one here. And then we end up with the same type of situation occurring right here. So this hydrogen makes a bond here. And then this pi bond ends up as a bond to the boron. And then at that point, we're going to get, uh, so we have this, this group here. Now this one's going to be another group attached to the boron. This is the boron. And we're going to have another one of these attached. And then there's still this hydrogen. And then it can happen a third time. And so it happens a third time. And we get this boron attached now to three of these. And so this is the kind of funky and hard part of the mechanism to memorize. You're going to do the same thing three times. And we end up with this so-called trialkyl borane. Uh, the, 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 the group, the substrate group here, um, is going to add to this three times. And so now, uh, we each of these substrate molecules, now it's time to replace where the boron, boron, is, boron is with the OH group. Okay. Uh, so why does this occur? As I mentioned, uh, the, the tertiary carbon here is more crowded with the methyl groups. So it's hard for the, full, the boron to get in here and attach. So instead, the hydrogen attaches at the, at the more substituted spot. Uh, if the boron tried to get in there, it would be sterically hindered. So that's why the boron attaches at the less substituted part. And that's the key part, because ultimately, that's where the OH is going to go. So here's the full mechanism. So we already got the trialkyl boron. So that was the first part of the mechanism. That was only the beginning. And, and so the R here is that whole group that we had just drawn. And here's where the hydrogen peroxide comes in. So we get, uh, and the base. So notice again, step two, let's go back to step two. We've talked now about step one, BH3, THF, right? Now we're going to talk about step two, hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide. So here we can see uh, we have the hydrogen peroxide and the sodium hydroxide. Those are going to react with one another. The hydroxide will pull the proton off of the hydrogen peroxide. That leaves this oxygen with three lone pairs and one bond, so it has a negative formal charge. And then we have water. Now at that point, we have this boron here, which is attached to two alkyl groups, or um, three alkyl groups. And the carbon has a higher electronegativity than the boron. So it's pulling the electrons outward, causing this boron to be partially positive charge. So then the oxygen attacks that boron, and we have now the boron has four bonds, one to the oxygen on the hydrogen peroxide, uh, or the, or rather the peroxyl ion. And, um, and now this boron is making four bonds, and it again has a negative formal charge because it, it usually only has three valence electrons, right? Uh, and so then what happens is that we have the alkyl group here go and attach itself to the oxygen. And then this oxygen-oxygen bond, and oxygen-oxygen bonds are very weak. Remember when we talked about fluorine-fluorine bonds? We were talking about bond uh, energies, and we said fluorine-fluorine bonds are not very strong, the FFF bond, because the fluorine is so electronegative, it wants to pull its own bond apart so that it will have two separate fluoride ions, right? Um, so the same thing happens with peroxide or fluorine atoms rather two fluorine atoms uh, so the same thing a similar thing happens with oxygen to a lesser extent it's also very electronegative so this bond is very weak it's easy for it to break and so we end up now with this alkyl group uh, is now attached to the oxygen which is still itself attached to this boron boron so notice this oxygen bond to the boron did not break Instead, the alkyl group attached here. And now we're almost at the alcohol. All we have to do is attach the hydrogen. And so 
we still have OHs. We have the base here. That attacks the boron, which again is even more positive now in formal charge because this will occur three times. So this whole reaction will happen again. So we'll have another, another one of these guys here. And again, the R here will attack uh, the oxygen Or, uh, sorry, the oxygen will attack the R. Whoopsie, I got it opposite. Always start your, your arrows with electrons. There's no electrons to give there. We have to start our arrow where the electrons are. So the electrons are right here. This is negative formal charge. It grabs to the R. Okay. Uh, and this bond breaks because these oxygens are just so, so pulling this bond apart, right? Uh, 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 so that's the next step. This breaks here, and we end up with a, uh, a bond now between this R and this O. Uh, sorry, I'm kind of drawing this uh, kind of badly. Let me let me try that again. Let me do this uh, in two steps, which I like I'm supposed to. So. We end up with an attack. Again, this is negative, so we get end up with an attack, not to the R group. It's an attack to the boron. Why to the boron? Because the boron is quite positive, right? It's got all these more electronegative atoms pulling electrons away from it. So this negative is attracted to that. Uh, and then we have this, we're going to have this boron attached now to this OR group. But now it's also attached to the OOH, to the peroxide. And we still have this other R group um, here. And we have this other R group here. So this R group is still there. Now this is where we do this type of step. So the R group is now going to move so it attaches right to the uh, right to here, uh, right to the oxygen. So this is going to go attach right to the oxygen, right? Uh, and then we're going to have the loss of this OH. And so then we're going to have another OR group attached. We're going to have now this boron. Notice now this R is attached to the O. So we have RO uh, here, uh, OR right here. We have another OR from before, and we still have now one R group. And this is going to happen one more time. So effectively what happens is we end up with an oxygen between the boron and the alkyl group. And then finally, when this happens three times, at that point, the OH attacks again. Why does it attack? Because it's very positive in here, right? It's, it's very positive right here where the boron is. I'm just going to draw an arrow. Positive here because we have these very electronegative oxygen atoms pulling the electrons away from the boron. And so then the OH attacks, and at that point, after that, then the OR group leaves. And so we have this OR group. It's almost an alcohol. Finally, uh, it's going to grab the proton from water. It'll leave those electrons behind. And finally, we get the alcohol. And this will happen two more times. Uh, the OH group will attack again. And remember, in this case, our, our R here, so we have OH, and the R was this guy. And so we're going to get three of these when this happens three times. So this is going to happen times three. Uh, each, each of these, we're going to have OH attack, and then it's going, to, uh, it's going to leave, as we saw here. Uh, hydrospiration is stereospecific. Uh, only the syn addition occurs. So the hydrogen and the OH are going to be attached at the same side. And the reason why uh, is because of the way, with the way this reaction works, right? Uh, we have this BH3 here, this BOR, B -O -R, um, and the way it attaches is going back here, the hydrogen and the boron attach at the same time. So they attach on the same side. The result is that we're going to end up attached on uh, the, the same side, the hydrogen and the, the OH group. Um, 
we'll have one pair of enantiomers, but we won't get the diastereomer here. So here we can say HOH will attach here either both on the top or both on the bottom. So in this case, if the H and OH attach on the top, we're going to have the OH here and the methyl will go down, the hydrogen will go down, and we'll have wedge and dash here. Whereas if the OH attached from the bottom, the methyl here, we got it pointed up, still on the dash, still on the dash here, hydrogen still on the wedge. Uh, so we get both enantiomers here, uh, but we do not get one where the hydrogen and the OH attach in, in two different sides. Now, in this case, for this carbon, it doesn't matter because uh, they're both, um, because uh, that it's not chiral, but it could matter, right? Uh, <clears throat> so only the syn addition occurs. So when we look at this one, it does occur. This, this carbon will be chiral. So notice here that we either, when we add the H and the OH in this, we either put them both on the dash or both on the wedge. We don't put one on the dash and one on the wedge. Okay, uh, so why don't you go and try to predict the product of this reaction, and in the next video, I will show you the answer.